long at the top, so just bear with me while I read through some of this. So today, the secretary wraps up his trip where he visited and met with the leaders in Djibouti, Kenya, and Angola. In his capstone and historic speech in Angola, the secretary discussed the strategic importance of Africa, our commitment to enhancing partnerships with our valued African partners, the power of democracy, and how we're looking to deepen defense relationships that are rooted in equality and mutual respect. As Secretary Austin, Austin said in his remarks, quote, Africa matters, it matters profoundly to the shape of the 21st century world, and it matters for our common prosperity and our shared security, end quote. He also went on to emphasize that, quote, we're joining hands with new partners and building new coalitions to oppose aggression and uphold sovereignty. And we're empowering our partners to pursue locally, nationally, and regionally led solutions to the dangers that they face, end quote. I would encourage everyone to take a look at his full speech, which is available at defense.gov. During his trip, the secretary also visited with U.S. military military personnel deployed to Djibouti and Kenya to voice his gratitude for their service and dedication to promoting peace, stability, and security in the region. Also today, on the plane ride home from Angola, Secretary Austin spoke by phone with Crown Prince and Prime Minister, His Royal Highness Solomon bin Hamad Al Khalifa, to convey his condolences for the September 25th attack reportedly carried out by Houthi elements on the Saudi-Yemen border, which killed Bahrainian service members and injured others. Secretary Austin strongly condemned the attack, underscoring that these unacceptable attacks threatened the long period of calm since the war in Yemen began. Uh, I believe yesterday, uh, Secretary Austin also spoke with his Japanese counterpart, newly appointed Minister of Defense Minoru Kihawara, earlier this morning. The secretary congratulated him on his new position, and they committed to further cooperation on the U.S.-Japan alliance priorities, including deeper and expanded multilateral cooperation in promoting a free and open Indo-Pacific region. And again, you'll be able to find that full readout on defense.gov. Shifting gears, Secretary Austin has taken unprecedented action across the department to help improve quality of life for our service members. Today, as part of broader efforts to ensure we take care of our people, one of Secretary Austin's top priorities, he approved a campaign to prevent suicide in the military aligned to five lines of effort. Over the past two years, and I'm sorry, over the past two and a half years, the department has taken meaningful steps to counter harmful behavior in all its forms, including suicide. While we recognize that su suicide has no single cause and no single preventive action, treatment, or cure will eliminate every individual suicide death, implement implementation of these actions demonstrates our unwavering commitment to promote the wellness, health, and morale of our total force and honor the memory of those lost to suicide. A copy of the Secretary's memo can be, can be found on defense.gov. Just a few more items here. Hello. Today, the Department of Defense also released its 2023 strategy for countering weapons of mass destruction. As many of you are aware, the United States faces a dynamic and evolving security environment characterized by competitors in possession of current and emerging WMD capabilities. As a result, the strategy addresses current and emerging WMD challenges and threats and provides direction for tailored methods to address them. The department, working closely with the interagency and U.S. allies and partners, will account for WMD threats holistically to prevent, withstand, operate through, and recover from WMD attacks. The strategy and additional information can also be found on defense.gov. Switching to tomorrow, tomorrow Secretary Austin will participate in an Armed Forces Farewell Tribute in honor of General Mark Milley, the 20th Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and welcome General C.Q. Brown Jr. as the 21st Chairman. General Milley has led the joint force in defense of this country admirably and selflessly, and we'd like to thank him and the entire Milley family for their selflessness and four decades long service to this nation. Last week, the Senate moved forward on confirming three of our highly qualified nominees, as you know, but unfortunately our list of nominees that need Senate confirmation continues to grow. As of, uh, as of yesterday, Senator Tuberville's hold now impacts 371 nominations. You've heard me say it over and over again, but I'll say it again. These holds impact our national security, our military readiness, and of course, our military families. The Secretary is committed to engaging with members of Congress in both parties until all of our well-qualified apolitical officers are confirmed. 
And last item here, as I'm sure is on everyone's mind, the likelihood of a government shutdown. First, we urge Congress to work in a bipartisan way to avert a government shutdown and pass a budget. Our priority is always to make sure that we have an on-time appropriations. And as bad as it could be to have a continuing resolution, which we always want to avoid, it's even worse for the defense of the nation to have a shutdown. So what I can say is if there is a shutdown in just a few days, our service members would be required to continue working, but would be doing so without pay, and hundreds and thousands of their civilian colleagues would be furloughed. A government shutdown is a worst case scenario for the department, so we continue to ask Congress to do its job and fund the government. And I know that was a lot, so with that, I will take your questions. I'm gonna go to the phones first, because I believe we have Lita joining us remotely. So Lita, if you're there. Yeah, hi, Sabrina, thanks so much. Um, I realize you may not be able to provide too much on this, but on uh, Travis King, can you give us an update on sort of what next for Travis King? since he arrived uh, overnight in Texas um, going forward? And then what concerns does the department have about anything King may have said to anyone in North Korea? And finally, do you have any more insight into why he left or why the North Koreans let him go? I realize that's a lot, but thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Lita. Um, so uh, just, I guess taking the last question first. So in terms of um, why he left and, and motivations for um, why he crossed over into the DPRK, again, as you know, that's still under investigation. That's something that the Army is leading um, with uh, UN command as well. So I will you know, let that investigation continue. Um, in, in terms of uh, details of what he is going through now, so as you mentioned, um, Private King arrived late last night, or um, apologies, early in the morning to San Antonio, where he will be going through a reintegration program. Um, how long he is there in this reintegration program is really dependent on each person that goes through. Uh, but what I can tell you is he'll be going through medical screenings, uh, medical evaluations, um, and then he'll be uh, meeting with professionals to assess his emotional and mental health uh, uh, well-being, um, and he'll be meeting with counselors. So this is something that you, I can't really put a timetable on, but um, he will be there uh, going through the reintegration program uh, for the immediate future. Um, and I'm so sorry, I'm, I forgot your second question, if you could repeat that. Yeah, sure. Uh, the, the question was, what concerns does the U.S. and the Pentagon have about what information he may have shared with North Korea? Thanks, Lita, uh, for reminding me. Um, well, during this process, he will be getting debriefed by U.S. military officials, so um, I don't really have more to share on that as it's still pretty early. Um, right now, what we are focused on is um, his well-being. Uh, this was obviously um, uh, Private King was in the DPRK for um, just over two months, so it's something that we're incredibly focused on, on making sure that his health, that he um, is uh, being able to to uh, uh, be reunited uh, with his family and also be able to go through their reintegration program. And with that, I'd be happy to come in the room. Yeah, Will. Um, just following up on that, um, sure. what if any disciplinary action is Private King facing at this point? Um, I know he was, he was scheduled to, to face some, some actions when he, when he was supposed to come back to the States earlier. Is that still on the table? Uh, and when will that determination be made if it hasn't been already? Yeah, so I don't have any more for you at this moment on any disciplinary actions that would be taken. Um, right now, what we are focused um, on is making sure that he is healthy. Um, I was told he was in good spirits when he was getting on um, the flight to return home. Um, this is, of course, uh, going through the reintegration program is something that's going to take time. Um, and so we're really focused on his health, um, reuniting him with his family. Um, and when we have more details provide, we'd be happy to do that. Did you have something else? I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, Chris. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, sure. A question on the shutdown and its impact on the training of Ukrainian sure. pilots. Um, will the training of Ukrainian pilots on F-16s um, in the U.S. occur if the government is shut down by the time they're ready to come over, or will that training be delayed or otherwise negatively impacted in any way if the government yeah. is still shut down? Then I have a follow-up. Okay. Um, in terms of shutdown impacts on training programs for Ukrainian pilots. Um, 
first, as you heard me say in my topper, the, a government shutdown is the worst case scenario that the department can face. Um, so you are going to have military uniform personnel coming in performing their duties, but as a result, you're going to have a majority of civilian personnel furloughed. So um, civilian personnel that are uh, involved in the training of Ukrainian pilots, um, such as English language training is what we're talking about right now, um, absolutely there could be impacts to training. Um, we're still reviewing some of these details. Uh, again, we're hoping that the Congress can work and, and find a bipartisan, bicameral way to avoid a government shutdown. But um, there's still more details that we're working through on the impacts that programs will have. What I will say is that you're going to have um, potentially trainers who, if you know three of them, let's say, are civilians and they're furloughed, and you have only one person that's a military personnel, and I'm just giving an example, you're going to have that person doing the jobs of the, his or her other colleagues so it's definitely going to have an impact to training um uh, on whatever that might be whether it's you know actual personnel in the room um or you know if this continues to go longer I, i'm not sure like the how much training could be delayed for other aspects of of pilot training but um at this point right now i just don't have like more specific details to offer right, right. Just to follow up. sure unit is also a guard unit um yeah so would that be functioning normally or, or would that be shut down but well exactly we're going through all the details right now um again i i don't have more to share at this exact moment um i can reiterate and i will continue to do so that a shutdown is literally the worst case scenario for this department we really don't want to have to go through uh, making painful decisions like this um and i'll just leave it at that and did you have a follow-up on that was your follow-up. Okay, Liz, and then I'll come to Jamie. Uh, my first question, um, so Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene had an amendment passed yesterday um, that Secretary Austin would only get paid a $1 salary. Um, your reaction to that? Well, look, that's pending legislation. I don't really have a comment on that um, in particular. What I can say is that the Secretary is deeply focused on the mission here for the Department. Uh, he's focused on defending our nation, protecting the, al the interests of our allies and partners, and of course, with a government shutdown, taking care of our people is one of his top priorities. Um, and that's something that I know the Secretary coming off of his trip um, back here home in the United States is, is really focused on the impacts of what the government shutdown means for our, our military service members. So I'll leave it at that. My second sure. question, um, a group of senators just released a bill um, to make sure that service members get paid in case of a possible shutdown. Um, is that something the Defense Department supports? And what happens if service members aren't paid? Um, well, to take the first question, uh, the, the last question first, if service members aren't paid in terms of what, like during the shutdown? during the shutdown if they aren't paid on time. So, I mean, if they aren't paid on time, what's going to happen is life continues to go on. So these service members have rent to pay, mortgages, childcare, um, you know, you think of the daily uh, expenses that you make, grocery bills, and those bills are still gonna incur for our service members, for our civilian colleagues, um, and they're not gonna be receiving a paycheck during this time. So those bills are gonna mount up. It's an incredibly stressful time um, for folks when there's any type of government shutdown. Um, and so that's, you know, they would, th that that's just what's going, that's the reality, unfortunately. Um, in terms of the, uh, I think you said it was a letter or legislation that's been introduced. Um, again, not legislation that has been passed, so would be, um, don't wanna get too far ahead of the ball here, but um, we shouldn't really be in this position. Uh, the fiscal year timeline deadline comes around every single year. Um, this is not a surprise to anyone in Congress that we need a, we should be passing an on times appropriations bill. Um, of course, we would want our, our service members to be paid. So of course, if that bill does pass, that's um, you know great for our, our service members, but uh, we really shouldn't be in this position where we're talking about parsing out who gets paid and when, um, when the reality is, is we have employees across the federal government that deserve an on-time appropriations bill, an on-time budget, and deserve Congress to work in their behalf to honor those those deadlines. Janie, and then I'll go to the phones and come back. Sabrina, uh, sure. regarding the unconditional release of a private king, uh -huh. do you believe that North Korea interrogated the private king and then expelled him because 
his evaluation has been devalued, and uh, what kind of uh, punishment awaits private king? Yeah, I wouldn't be able to speculate anymore on his treatment in the DPRK. Um, again, he's going through the reintegration program. He will be uh, interviewed with or, or meeting with U.S. military officials. Um, I just don't have any more to add. In terms of any type of uh, punishment, I, I think that got to what Will was asking earlier. Um, right now, we're focused on his health. We're focused on you know ensuring that he's doing okay. Um, I can't imagine what it was like to spend two months um, in North Korea without you know access or, or without being able to um, be around your friends, your loved ones. And so we're making sure we're focused on um, his health and making sure that he uh, is doing okay in San Antonio. In North Korea, Kim Jong-un specified the nuclear force policy in the Constitution and announced that he would drastically increase the number of nuclear weapons. What is your stance on North Korea will not giving up nuclear development? Yeah, that just adds to the incredibly destabilizing rhetoric that we've seen out of North Korea before. Um, I don't really have a comment on changes to the Constitution other than that, uh, you know, we've seen North Korea trying to, we've seen comments like this before, and I think I'll just leave it at that. I'm going to go to the phones here really quick. Um, Haley with CNN. Yeah, thanks, Sabrina. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk about with the shutdown, and I just spoke a little bit about the impact on families not getting paid. Um, I wonder if you can expand on that a little bit. I mean, I know, I know that we know that service member fam a lot a lot of military families experience things like food insecurity already. I mean, is the Pentagon um, have any plans or putting anything in place to kind of take care of those families if they're going without paychecks, or what, what is that going to look like on y'all's end? Haley, that's a great point, and thanks for the question. This is exactly why we shouldn't be in this position. Um, we do have families that um, are across our military force that um, are, you know, either it's food insecure or require access to child care um, or whatever, whatever it might be that they require. Um, we really shouldn't have been in this position to begin with um, when it comes to a government shutdown because the shutdown is going to impact all of these families. Um, Unfortunately, this is really up to Congress to decide uh, what they are going to do when it comes to funding the government. Um, we are going to, of course, uh, work to make sure our folks um, know that we are here for them. But in terms of actually funding, being able to pay our troops, um, that's something that Congress really needs to authorize and not something that's on the Department of Defense. Um, I'll take one more from the phones here. Uh, Brianna Riley, a roll call. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, quick question about Alabama Con Congressman Mike Rogers. Today he said that he would work to withhold funds for the SpaceCom headquarters following the administration's basing decision. I'm curious to what extent would a lack of funding be an impediment for the Colorado Springs site, considering that SpaceCom has already nearly reached FOC? And separately, if you have any update on the timeline for SpaceCom HQ to reach FOC, that'd be great. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thanks so much for the question. I don't have a um, time. I, I don't have any specifics on um, when Space Command will reach FOC. I would encourage you to reach out to Space Command for that. Um, in terms of withholding funding, I mean, look, this is a, a command that um, is on the forefront of uh, of protecting American interests and our allies um, all around the world, and of course in space. And um, withholding any type of funds, of course, would be detrimental to to the to the force, but also the command in Colorado Springs. Um, I haven't seen the full comments yet, so I, I don't want to go any further than that. But um, appreciate the question. Great, I'll come back in the room. Rio. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, two questions. Sure. First, the Taiwan unveiled its first domestically produced submarine today. How much does the Pentagon assess this new capability might complicate China's invasion strategy or blockade strategy moving forward. Yeah, I, I've seen the reports on that. I would refer you to Taiwan to speak more to that. I, I don't have any further comment. Secondly, sure. the, the Pentagon had a working level talk with the Chinese on cyber issues mm -hmm. last week. Uh, do you think the Chinese are now more open to military to military talks? And does the Pentagon focus more on the working level talk rather than the secretary level talk as the Chinese defense minister is missing for a month? Well, we always encourage um, communication at the highest levels uh, with the PRC. 
Um, we're going to continue to push for that. As you just mentioned, the secretary has not had a conversation with his counterpart. Um, so we are going to continue to urge for that. We believe open lines of communication is the best way to avert any type of crisis. Um, it is, it's obviously uh, good steps for it that uh, we've seen with engaging at other levels, but we still believe um, at the highest levels, there needs to be mill to mill communication um, between our two governments. Constantine. Thanks, Sabrina. Um, on the suicide uh, prevention front, sure. um, so of the 100 plus <coughs> recommendations that the committee reviewed, uh, it's not enacting, I believe, 16, including pretty much all of the gun control recommendations that yeah. the independent panel recommended and sort of intimated that was the, the heart of their, you know, the main thrust of their recommendations. I mean, does that, from, from the OSD's perspective, does that not sort of blunt the, <coughs> the impact of the recommendations that the panel was making? Um, and I thank you for the question. I just wanted to make sure I was looking at the right um, document here. Um, again, there was thorough evaluations. We appreciate the Spurks Committee uh, review and um, the recommendations that they made. Um, that was something that, um, while we didn't take up for this, it's not something that we wouldn't rule out, but it's something you know that we, uh, for this moment, we are focusing on the five lines of effort that we have under, that how we'll have different actions as a component. And just for awareness, the five lines of effort that are in, that include enabling tasks um, are aimed to foster a supportive environment, improve the delivery of mental health care, address stigma and other barriers to care, reverse suicide, sorry, revise suicide prevention training, and promote a culture of lethal means safety. So again, it's not something that's off the table, but this is what we're focused on right now. Um, and a quick follow-up. So of the 100 plus recommendations, I believe 61 are subject to the availability of funds. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna do them if we get the money. Is yep. there any concern that the funds will not be there because, I mean, we're, the recommendations say that they're going to be completed by 2030, so we've got a good amount of time before right. the last of these comes into play. Any chance the money just doesn't, the money dries up? Well, I, I don't have a crystal ball, uh, so I, <laughs> I can't predict the future. But, um, look, the issue of suicide, I think, has received um, uh, attention and support, or uh, I should say addressing the issue of suicide amongst our military members has received support on both sides of the aisle and in, uh, you know, in, in both chambers of Congress. So uh, we would certainly be hopeful that there would be, that they would support our efforts and provide adequate funding uh, for what we need to implement some of these recommendations. Um, and again, I think on both sides, you're seeing um, a want and a need uh, to address these issues that we're, that we're facing. Yeah, Aaron. Yes. Uh, oh, thank sorry, you. I meant to, I'll come back to you after Aaron. Oh, okay. yeah. So while the Space Force was in Japan the other day, they stated they have been internally exploring the idea of establishing a communication hotline between U.S. Space Force and China. Um, has Salts General Saltzman tried to communicate with his counterpart or any Chinese officials since he's been in I, Space Force? I would direct you to his office. I just don't have anything for you to read out here. Um, again, what I emphasized earlier is that we would, of course, encourage high-level conversations and communications lines to be open between us and the PRC. But uh, for more on General Saltzman's conversations, I would, I would direct you to his office. Has anyone in U.S. Space Force, it's, only, it's been four years that it has been established, almost four years. Yeah. Has anyone in Space Force tried to... Uh, communicate with China. And that's a great question for the Space Force. Yeah. Yeah, Voice of America here. Uh, I have yeah. a follow up on the Ukrainian pilot training. Uh, so, has it begun already? Uh, how many pilots do you anticipate to have? And how long will it take before they get moved to the actual training in Arizona? Sure. So, um, English language training has started for several pilots. Um, I don't have specific numbers for you on that. Um, the English language training will vary depending on. Um, proficiency and skill. So again, don't have an exact timeline of when folks will then move from that training to start um, uh, pilot training. But yes, English language training has begun. On Abrams tanks, mm -hmm. so can you confirm the arrival in Ukraine and how many tanks were in the first tranche and when to expect the rest of them arriving in the battlefield? So um, 
exactly what you said. This is the first tranche of Abrams tanks that arrived. Um, I believe the Ukrainians uh, issued a statement that they had arrived. So I would refer you to the Ukrainians and what they said, but I am not disputing that. Um, not going to get into more specific numbers or uh, any further details of how many and when they're arriving. That's really up to the Ukrainians to announce when they're ready. And um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Okay. Of the Russian fleet commander. So there were like reports that, yeah, he might have been killed in a recent attack. Ukraine said he was dead. Russian denied it. So do you have any confirmation of these reports? What's your assessment? I I don't have uh, any confirmation. I I were uh, unfortunately I just don't. I I can't really confirm the conf uh, I cannot confirm the reports at this time. I've seen the reports, uh, but can't confirm anything. Yeah. In the back, and then I'll come back over here. Thanks, ma'am. Kimberly yeah. Underwood from Signal yeah. Magazine. I wanted to ask about the suicide prevention campaign that you sure. announced today in the five steps pertaining to one of the one of the steps, the revised suicide prevention training. Does the secretary have a specific milestone plan or timeline that he'd like to see from the Defense Suicide Prevention Office as far as that revised curriculum? Um, you know, I would direct you to what's online right now. It's pretty extensive. Um, I'm not going to put like timelines on anything. I think what we want to see here at the department is is progress being made to um, reduce and ultimately end suicides. Um, but again, I would direct you to defense.gov for, for more information. I mean, obviously the that um, office is going to roll out the curriculum, but kind of will that be brought into schoolhouses across the department or how does that cur kind of curriculum get rolled out I guess I'm not going to get ahead of um, how it's going to get rolled out I will let the experts do that um, when I have more information I'd be happy to get back with you but at this time I just we're excited about the the recommendations and the rollout today but I think those are great questions that we might be able to answer at a future date yeah Sabrina, um, you mentioned at the top uh, the uh, call between Secretary Austin and his Bahraini counterpart yeah. uh, following this uh, drone attack on the Saudi Yemen border area. Um, has, you know, apart from a phone call, um, has the U.S. military taken any action to respond to this attack, even in a deterrent manner or sort of defensive manner, uh, on behalf of Bahrain and Saudi Arabia? No, we have not taken action. Um, again, we have urged for, for calm. And of course, uh, we are dedicated to promoting peace and stability in the region. That's something that we're continuing to push for. Um, but, you know, again, uh, that's something that uh, the Secretary was really calling to convey our con deepest condolences. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Hi, thanks, Sabrina. Um, so France, a few days ago, announced they were pulling out 1,500 troops in Niger by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Is that impacting any U.S. considerations of also pulling out troops for given the security environment in the country? Yeah, right now we're focused on moving our personnel and our assets, which continues to be ongoing from Air Base 101 to Air Base 201. Um, so that's our real focus right now. Um, again, Given the constraints of, of moving that, um, and we know the French military, have, of course, um, uh, left, we're really focused on our own force protection um, at this moment, but I don't have anything more to add. I'll take one more question, and then we'll, okay, and I'll come to you, and then we'll wrap it up. All right. Thank you, thank you yeah. Sabrina. Um, regarding to the call between uh, Secretary Austin uh, and uh, uh, his, uh, the Crown Prince, uh, Bahraini Crown Prince, Regarding to Yemen, what's happened on, to, uh, on September 25th. So how much uh, you have concerns about um, this uh, kind of actions could impact the, long, um, the longest period of camp since the war in the Yemen? Well, that's certainly what we're concerned about. Um, again, this was you know, a, a very long period of calm since the war in Yemen began. Um, that's why we are urging that um, calm and uh, urge stability in the region. Um, really, you know, again, the secretary's call was to express condolences. Um, we hope that we don't see an uptick in violence in any way, uh, which is why he made that call today. All right, I'll take one last question, then we'll wrap it up. Yeah. Thanks, Sabrina. Uh, so this is in regards to a 60 Minutes report from last week, and it showed that the U.S. funding in Ukraine has gone to things like buying seeds and fertilizer for farmers, um, paying the salaries and pensions of over 50,000 of you know their government employees and even subsidizing small businesses. So you know I think many Americans can understand providing humanitarian aid, but a small business loan seems to take a step further than that. So I'm just wanted to ask you why are we paying for such things? So that's actually a question for other agencies and departments here. We we here 
at the department focus on military assistance to Ukraine. Um, there are other departments across the agency that uh, focus on uh, whether it's USAID, State Department, energy, that um, do provide uh, assistance in different ways to Ukraine. I think you can understand that in a war, um, your economy gets decimated, um, businesses get blown up, um, apartment buildings crumble. So, of course, there's other ways to provide aid to Ukraine that's not just through military assistance. But on those specific questions, I would direct you to the agencies that uh, fall under their purview. DOD funding goes to humanitarian aid. It's all um, military. DOD funding are secure. I mean, you've been in this room. You've seen me announce presidential drawdown authorities. You've seen me announce USAI packages. Uh, we outline them as thoroughly as we can of what um, is in those packages that include weapons, systems, different capabilities, um, armor, winter coats, gloves. I don't know if you consider a winter coat humanitarian assistance, but um, these are all things that are needed on the battlefield, and that's what the department is focused on providing. Okay, great. I'm going to wrap it up there. Thanks, everyone.